Ramsey. Jesus to me is the celebrity of all celebrities, the unparalleled and the unprecedented, the centerpiece of all civilization, the superlative of all excellence. He is the sum of all human greatness. He is the source of divine power. His name is only one able to save. His blood is only one able to cleanse. His ear is open to a sinner's calm. His hand is quick to leave the fallen soul. He is the celebrity of all celebrities. He supplies mercy for the struggling soul. He sustains the tempted and the tried. He strengthens the weak and weary. He sympathizes with the broken and the wounded. He guards and guides the wanderer. He delivers the captive and defends the helpless. He heals the sick and cleans the leper. He binds up the brokenhearted. He is the celebrity of all celebrities. Jesus is the key to all knowledge. He is the spring of wisdom, the doorway of deliverance, the pathway of peace, the roadway of righteousness, the highway of holiness, the gateway to glory. He is the celebrity of all celebrities. Jesus is enough. He is all sufficient king. He is the king of Jews, the king of Israel, the king of ages, the king of kings. He is the king of holiness. Glory be to the celebrity of all celebrities. He is our sovereign king. There is nothing which can contain his blessings outpoured. There is no measure for his limitless love. He is enduringly strong. He is entirely steadfast. He is immortally faithful. He is imperially powerful. He is impartially merciful. I wish I could more accurately describe him, but he is indescribable, irresistible, invincible, incomprehensible. You can't outlive him. You cannot live without him. Pilate couldn't fight him. The Pharisees couldn't stand him. By the phone, they couldn't stop him. Herod couldn't kill him. Death couldn't conquer him. Beloved is the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the God of the future and the God of the past. His name is Jesus. Jesus, the celebrity of all celebrities.
Let us start by prayer. Dear Jesus, we humble ourselves before you today, but we want to lift up our hearts and our hands in total praise for the gift of life. We thank you that we can have this moment of conversing about your word and the glorious promises it offers to all of us. We thank you above all for Jesus who died and is now gone above, for his ministry in heaven where he continues to reconcile the whole world unto himself. And we pray that we may be reconciled at this time. We give you praise and honor for who you are, a God with no shadow of variableness, who does not change, who is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And we pray that as we strengthen each other by looking at the facts from a biblical point of view, that, Lord, you may lead us and guide us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I want to talk to you today about a subject that is very close to my heart. Because I've discovered that sometimes we have to choose between Christ and a crisis. And it is a foregone knowledge that many of us today, our hearts are failing us for fear because of the coronavirus. And all the implications thereof on our economy, in our country, on our relationships, because of the lockdown, and all the attended maladies that comes from this crisis which we are facing as a country. There is an insidious malady that is creeping into the church of God. Satan amongst our brethren feels strongly that they should take it as their personal burden to advocate for strange theories that are devoid of salvific value. Uh, precious time and resources are spent in public and 
private agitations and discussions that bear little fruit except dividing people and congregations. Fear, paralyzing fear is sown in the hearts of poor listeners through dangerous obfuscations and speculations on secretive signs of the times or end of time events. Conspiracy theories of every you are touted as the true and only gospel for the times. Men and women strain every fiber of their being in an attempt to prove their knowledge of secret societies and how these evil forces are ganging up together against God's defenseless and unsuspecting people. The result is a siege mentality that leaves everybody suspecting anybody without and within the church. It is indeed true what someone assessing the present environment some time ago said, nowadays he observed, it is even difficult to trust one's shadow without first asking it to present its full credentials. People are no longer sure of even those they trust in their families and the society and communities. There is a concerted effort by a particular category of people to give interpretations to signs and symbols, spurious twists uh, put on normal biblical prophecies and wayward hermeneutical emphasis is imposed on simple biblical tests. Uh, and I will give an example, for an example. For an example, it is not uncommon to hear persons ascribing meaning to every form of the letter T, and I'm giving an example, including that of the Red Cross and the symbol of the cross on the Seventh Adventist March disputed emblem, to some form of ignorant subscription to the ancient mystical Babylonian religion related to Tammuz. The mark of the beast as opposed to the seal of God in the book of Revelation 13 is reduced to a sophisticated electronic card system to be superimposed upon human beings with an express aim to reducing them to mere robotics without individuality, power to think and to do. Ironically, the first nation with and agitation for these so-called new truths is meant to strengthen the faith of those that care to give it an ear. However, the practical result has always been mortal fear of the future. Corrosive guilt that stems from the realization that one could have unknowingly been deeply involved with the forces of darkness and galling feeling that perhaps God has lost control and that the devil is in full charge of the world as we know it today. There are factors that lead to fascination with ornaments, symbols, and signs. There are factors that inspire people to come up with theories that are divergent, divergent from what the word of the Lord says in the Bible. Number one, people are ignorant of the word of God. Somebody said long time ago, there are three kinds of people in the world today, namely those who fear nothing. Number two, those who fear everything. Number three, those who know the word of God. Those who fear nothing can carry out with their life in such a manner that they go head on, slap bang into trouble without even uh, understanding it or being aware of it. They are obstinate, they are incorrigible, they don't want to understand or listen to advice. They just simply go on. They fear nothing. And I know you understand what I'm talking about. Number two, those who fear everything, they see the devil and demons under every bush, under every crevice. They are trembling with fear. They suspect everybody. They look at their friends, their relatives, their family members, and think that maybe these are agents of the devil himself. Uh, you are suspected to be a Freemason. You are suspected to be the agent of a political or religious system that is bound to destroy God's people. They fear everything. They speak 
and see the devil in everything they do. And then we have those of the third category, those who know the word of God. Those who know the word of God, from Genesis to Revelation, they know that they can glean and be strengthened by the promises of God himself. And these are the ones which I will be able to talk about today because in the book of Amos chapter 3 verse 7, we are, we are told that the Lord will never ever accept or allow anything to happen to us except he first reveals these messages, these things to his servants, the prophets. The word of the Lord says, wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his ways by listening to the word of God. It is important for us to know that those who know the word of God will be safe and secure in their understanding and response to the events of the world. In the book, Great Controversy, page 625, Ellen G. White has this to say. None but those who have fortified their minds with the truth of the scriptures will be able to stand during the last great conflict. Number two, there is much concern about crisis than about Christ. The great controversy, my brothers and sisters, is not a theater in which the devil is showing off his prowess, but a platform for the unveiling of God's eternal grace to humanity. The war is not about the love of power it is, and its corrupt influence upon humanity. It is about the power of love as we experience it in God himself. It is not that the devil is in full control of this world. You need to know that God is still on his throne. Number three, there is fear, fear of the future. Even when we listen to the prophetess of God, as she says, we have nothing to fear in the future, except as we can forget how the Lord has led us in the past. We may strengthen ourselves by knowing that we may not know what the future holds, but we know who holds the future. In the book of Jeremiah, the loved verse from Jeremiah chapter uh, 29 verse 11, it says, I know the plans which I have for you. And therefore you can be rest assured that even in the midst of the pandemic, even in the midst of trouble, God is still in control. Number four, there is an insatiable desire for sensationalism. There is one God, my brothers and sisters, one faith. There is one baptism. We have 28 fundamental beliefs, nothing more, nothing less. Only truth can set us free. We must not add or subtract. That is why the Bible says we have got only one truth, and that truth is not a set of propositions. It is not of a set of theoretical propositions. That truth is found only in Jesus. The book of John chapter 14 verse 6 says, I'm the way, the truth, and the life, says Jesus. There is also, number five, an honest desire to help the church of God. And we cannot help God. God has always been and is always uh, and will always be in control. The book of Isaiah chapter 40 verse 28 verse 31 says, Have you not heard, has it not been told you that the Lord, the everlasting God, is the creator of the heavens and the earth? His understanding no one can fathom. He gives strength to those who are weak and he takes charge of the situation as it is. Even youth will run and grow tired and weary, but those who wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and never faint. Matthew chapter 16 verse 18 says, even if you feel like there is shaking and, and, and movement in the church of God, it is the church of God. It is the ship Zion. It will sail through these stormy seas and we are going to arrive at our destination because this is not our church. It belongs to God himself. And in the book of Matthew chapter 16 verse 18, he says, upon this rock I will build my church and the gates of hell will not, shall not prevail against it. 
So after listening to the voice of the Lord himself, I say to you today, do not fear. Do not fear. Do not fear. Do not fear. Do not fear the future because it is in the palm of God's hand. And I told you that we may not know what tomorrow will bring. We may not know what the future holds. We may not understand what is coming on our way. But thank God we have in our hearts, we have in our homes, we have in the church someone who holds the future in the palm of his hand. And that someone is the God who created the heavens and the earth, the sea and the dry land, the God who does not change, who is the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. And because he holds the future in the palm of his hand, even if we don't know what the future holds, thank God we know who holds the future. I say to you, do not fear. Do not fear hunger and starvation because of the economic situation we find ourselves in. Economists are telling us that we are, we are facing a recession. In fact, some of them are saying we might be f facing a full depression. But let me tell you and give you this encouragement from the word of the Lord. God is our refuge and our strength, a very present help in times of trouble. Therefore, we will not fear. The Lord says through his servant that he has a thousand ways which he can use to give provision to his people of which we know nothing of. God will take care of us. We should not fear hunger and starvation. We must not fear sickness. The Bible says in the book of Psalm chapter 91, verse 5 and 6, Thou shalt not be afraid for the terror by night, nor for the arrow that flieth by day. Verse 6 says, Nor for the pestilence that walketh in darkness, which means this pestilence is walking in darkness. It is an invisible enemy. We must not be afraid of it, nor for the destruction that wasteth at noonday. Do not fear. Do not fear the devil and his demons. He is a defeated foe. He is a defeated fellow. He roars like a lion, but there is the real lion of Judah, and his name is Jesus. Do not fear crisis, my brothers and sisters. Follow Christ. He is the way, the truth, and the life. John 14, verse 6. And lastly, do not fear death. Even if the conditions as they are now, even if the economic situation as it is now can deprive us until the point of death, I say to you, do not be afraid. You know that the last enemy that is going to be destroyed is death itself. What we need to do is to encourage each other that when all these things are happening, let us lift our heads towards the eastern sky for our redemption is closer than when we first believed. When you see all these things, know that Jesus is coming back again. I want to pray with you as I close this message. I hope it fills you with hope. It fills you with expectation, knowing that Christ is coming back again. May it be that all of us can strain all our fibers and muscles to say, we want to accept Jesus Christ as our personal Savior. So that when he comes with the clouds of heaven and the roll will be called up yonder, our names must also be there. As for me and my family, we have decided to serve the Lord. And I hope that that is your wish too. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for the encouragement we find in your word. I pray, dear Father, that you may bless my brothers and sisters who are watching this message that you may strengthen them, help them to have a, an expectation of a good life because you are there with us. You will protect and defend us with jealous care. Help us, dear Father, to increase our faith in you because, Lord, you are our only hope. Please write our names in the books of life. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.
Just 